It's not often that a player gets hailed as the white Pele and gets away with it. But in the case of Zico, he absolutely lived up to it. To the point where Pele himself called him the closest player to him stylistically. Zico was a 5'8 attacking midfielder who had a magnetic control of the ball and an eye for goal that would make a Cyclops jealous. Scoring well over 500 career goals whilst playing as a 10. A lot of you may have never heard of this guy and those of you who have, it's most likely because you're one of those rats who picks classic exile on FIFA kickoff mode against your friends back in the day. In fact, I'll hold my hands up. When analysing the Socrates tapes for our lesson a few weeks ago, all I could think about was how every single attack went through Zico. His meticulous free kicks put him up there in the top 10 most scored free kicks of all time. Literally just one and two behind Messi and Ronaldo, according to the majority of sources. I've scouted through as much footage as is available on the internet. So grab your pen and paper and let's see if he passes the eye test to match these insane numbers that he was dropping. In 1953, Arthur Antunes Coimbra was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, although he was Portuguese by blood. That didn't affect his passion for the game though, as this kid was often seen skipping school to kick ball in the streets. His older brothers ran a team called Juventude, and whenever he'd play alongside these guys much older than him, people were so impressed by his talent that they gave him the Arthur Zinho nickname, which then moved into variations of Arthur Zico and to Zico until they landed on Zico. At the age of 14, he had gone for a trial at Flamengo, the club he loved most, even though his brothers were to get into joined them both as professionals at Club America. He started off in and out the team and for most people, his undeniable quality was not enough to make up for the clear physical deficiencies. Whilst most would end up packing their bags and quitting, he started moving like Vegeta in that spaceship trying to go Super Saiyan, embarking on a rigorous body development program to ensure that he developed that muscle by force. This refusal to have any time off is quite the difference to what we usually hear of Brazilians. And it worked. After 81 goals in 116 youth matches, he was pushed into the first team where he would take the league by storm. Zico quickly became the most important player for a struggling Flamengo team who had never won a Campeonato Brasileiro Serie A, a Copa do Brasil or even a Copa Libertadores. His early years were a struggle, even though he did pick up a Campeonato Carioca within a year of joining the first team. For as much as he had the ability to cook, you cannot give the chef tomatoes and milk and expect him to chef up something crazy. Guys were either shutting him out the game completely as the obvious danger man or teammates were simply not finishing their dinner when they were served on the plate. In 1974, his goal numbers began to suddenly explode as he took it upon himself to simply waltz through teams without the need for any assistance. He'd pick up another Campeonato Carioca, but the major trophy still eluded him. For someone so determined to win everything, you can only imagine the stress it was causing him. The problem was then exacerbated by his early international career, where he'd scored the goal that helped Brazil qualify to the Olympics against Argentina, only to then not be called up to the squad for the tournament itself. This one hurt, and after vanishing from Flamengo's training sessions for 10 days, his brothers had to persuade him to not give up on football, and it's a good thing they got through to him. In the 1978 World Cup, Zico was now 25 and hitting his prime. A last minute bullet header by Zico was disallowed by Clive Thomas after he had apparently blown the whistle for some reason while the ball was still in the air from a corner. No problem though, because Zico was going to score in the second round against Peru while dragging his nation almost single-handedly at times. It's a shame that assist numbers were not calculated like that back in the day because I can imagine this guy's numbers would have been absurd. He'd eventually pick up a bronze medal in that World Cup and then another bronze in the 1979 Copa America. In the next World Cup, a stacked Brazil squad aimed to regain their spot as the kings of the football world. But Zico's four goals during that tournament were not enough to prevent them being eliminated by Italy. Perhaps that 3-2 result may have been different were Zico not suspended and watching from the sidelines. Despite the frustrations, he had now gained the hearts of millions of around the world for the joy that he put on their faces when playing. He went back to club football with hundreds of offers but still felt that he had a point to prove. This dude turned into an unstoppable force, breezing through anyone and anything in his path to score goal after goal and pick up trophy after trophy. The Campeonato Cariocos were flowing in back to back years and then in 1980 he finally got his hand on the Campeonato Brasileiro Serie A for the first time in the club's history. The next year he'd play an integral role in them lifting the Copa Libertadores and the Intercontinental Cup. Two more Serie A titles would follow in back to back years and after almost 400 goals for Flamengo across those 12 years, he finally decided to take the trip to Europe. He arrived at Udinese amidst much controversy as the league had no idea how a club of their stature could afford to make Zico the most expensive player of all time at 4 million euros, surpassing Maradona's record. They caved into fan pressure and Zico wasted no time announcing himself. 
scoring 19 goals in his first season, only finishing behind Platini in the top scorer's charts while playing four less games. The only reason he wasn't picking up Ballon d'Ors was because it was for Europeans only back then, but he had the streaks. Zico was voted as 1983's World Player of the Year by World Soccer Magazine, and his free kicks were so inevitable that Italian TV shows would have segments where they debate how they could stop them. It's like asking Mika Richards and Jamie Carragher how they would stop killing Mbappe at his best. Unfortunately, Udinese's backline was terrible, so Udinese scoring double the amount of goals they did in the year pre previously didn't help them much as they'd finished ninth. He'd become disillusioned with a lack of spending the following year and end up missing games through injuries and suspensions for arguing with refs. The Italian adventure was coming to an end after two years, but not before one last hurrah for his adoring fans against Diego Maradona's Napoli side, where they'd go band for band, scoring free kicks and smashing the woodwork multiple times before Diego finally won it at the end as he leapt into the air to punch the ball past the keeper into an empty net. Where have we seen this one before? Zico was back at his beloved Flamengo in 1985, now a 32 year old experienced head. It seemed as though the only way anyone could stop this guy was to physically block him from going on those mazy dribbles. He would get booted around the pitch by tug defenders to the point where his career had to keep on going on pause, suffering multiple injuries for months on end. These injuries meant he'd have a very limited impact off the bench at the 1986 World Cup for Brazil. And with that, his last chance to win something for his country. In his final five years back at Flamengo, he'd stuck up his trophy cabinet just a little more with his first ever. Copa Uniao in 1987 to add to his Campeonato Carioca one in 1986, his seventh overall and his 13th Flamengo trophy altogether. Officially, his second spell with Flamengo would end with only 23 goals in 74 games. But take that with a pinch of salt because them numbers for an aging attacking midfielder, when combined with the countless assists I'm sure he had, is still highly impressive. His final official game for the club would be in December 1989, a 5-0 win where he'd score against rivals Fluminense. But his actual farewell game saw him face a World Cup Masters team with the likes of Mario Kempes, Claudio Gentile, Falcao and Karl-Heinz Rummenigge to name a few. Zico would lead the club as their second all-time appearance maker and his 508 goals would place him number one on their all-time top scorers charts. When you check the list of clubs blessed by Zico's presence, Sumitomo Metals is not a team you often see, but after a couple years of boredom during retirement doing up politics, he'd accept an offer to join the Japanese second division team, where he'd obviously end up as top scorer in the entire league. After that season, the entire football hierarchy was scrapped in Japan in favour of a new league, and Sumitomo Metals would now rebrand as the Kashima Antlers we know today. As you'd expect, he'd score a hat-trick on the opening day of the J-League against Nagoya Grampus, a team most known today for being coached by Arsene Wenger back in the day. He wasn't here for this a fun kickabout and easy sponsorships to fill his pockets. He was determined to put his new team on the map by force. All those obstacle courses in Takeshi's castle must have been inspired by Zico's ability to weave through defenders and leave them stuck in the mud. They'd win the J-League Suntory series and finished runners-up in the league to establish themselves as serious competitors. His 46 goals in 66 games were impressive enough, but his work rate and commitment made him a legend in Japan, a country with a culture that values these traits so highly. They even gave him the nickname Saka no Kamisama or God of Soccer for those of you who don't speak seven languages like myself. Furthermore, they'd go on to build a statue of him outside the ground as the curtains officially closed on a phenomenal career. Zico may go down as one of the most underrated players of all time. Perhaps his legacy in the eyes of stat merchants is somewhat affected by the fact that he never got to win the World Cup for his country. But his individual numbers and performances displayed across a career of over 20 seasons were enough to earn the respect of the world's greatest players. In 1999, Zico would finish 7th in the FIFA Player of the Century vote amongst an entire grand jury. Watching this footage, it's impossible to deny his excellence. But what really hit home is the perseverance he showed through all obstacles to continue improving and giving 100% for his team. Now that EA have given him an icon card, the younger generation will hopefully respect and realize how much of a special talent Zico was. If this is your first time watching Zico, hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, leave a like, comment what iconic team of the last 20 years you'd love to have seen him play in, and subscribe for new lessons every Monday. Class dismissed. Bosch.